In general, people are, are quite a, uh, down, downbeat about the Chinese economy, I must say, these days. And, and not surprisingly, uh, Chinese currency has seen an interesting um, a movement. And um, this one-way appreciation has stopped being halted by the central bank. Um, since then, the currency has um, uh, declined by 3% against US dollar, which pumped the speculation whether this move um, w w was a new trend. Uh, and of course, just last week, um, European Central Bank uh, has made a very, very unorthodox move. I mean, this is a quantitative easing. You set uh, interest rate below zero, and Switzerland did that in the 90s. So I think against this backdrop, it would be very good to just um, to talk about some of the issues, and of course, and also have a conversation with you. Um, after this conversation, we should have some drinks and the food. But first of all, I would like to invite Professor Liu Chao um, just to, um, um, to talk about finance 2.0 and implications for corporate China and the multinationals 2.0. 2.0, OK. Professor Liu Chao. Yeah. Mm. OK. Uh, uh, I know that the title of tonight is about RMB uh, internationalization. But I want to put this in a uh, slightly, you know, slightly bigger context, uh, in the context of uh, financial reform uh, currently uh, going on uh, in China. So I, I'm thinking about uh, this new concept, uh, which is called you know, Finance 2.0, which means that uh, it's a new generation uh, financial system, which is uh, uh, different from the, uh, the current uh, financial system. Uh, so probably I'm going to just spend uh, uh, maybe 10 minutes uh, talking about uh, why this is important and uh, uh, how we visualize, perceive uh, finance 2.0 uh, going forward and uh, what could be the implications uh, for corporations in China and also uh, for MNCs uh, operating in China going forward. Uh, I want to uh, just start with uh, a big picture, uh, which is about um, uh, the rise of uh, corporate China uh, in recent years. So here I'm showing you um, the numbers of uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, from US and also from China. Uh, I, I, we look at the past uh, 15 years, you can see that uh, the number of uh, uh, Chinese firms uh, entering on this list uh, keeps increasing uh, from two firms in 1996 uh, to uh, one, uh, 89 companies uh, in 2013. And meanwhile, the number of US firms uh, declines uh, from almost 200 to 132. Uh, Fortune 500 basically uh, choose uh, the list uh, based on size, uh, so based on the total sales, uh, the top line of uh, income settlement. I think uh, by this trend, uh, my estimation is that uh, uh, probably by 2016, uh, China will overtake the US uh, to become the country, number one country in the world with uh, uh, most number of large companies in the world. So that, that is it, what is going on uh, in the corporate sector in China now. But I think uh, if you look at the other side of this picture, uh, you see slightly different story. Uh, because uh, out of the 89 companies, only seven of them are private companies. So eight, more than 80 of them are SOEs. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, if you are talking about uh, uh, the brand names uh, which can be recognized uh, globally, uh, probably no, not too many people uh, can name one or two uh, Chinese brands. So I think that is a typical sign about uh, what is going on uh, in the corporate China, in corporate China, which means that in the past 30 years, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of large companies in China, but uh, we do not have uh, too many uh, great companies. I think one of the uh, reasons uh, for that uh, is because of the financial system. Uh, you know the current financial system, current uh, uh, practice uh, in, uh, in in finance. I call the finance 1.0. Uh, I think I, I'm going to show you one chart uh, which demonstrates why uh, finance actually uh, shares the blame uh, for a lack of uh, great companies in China. Uh, I think uh, I have a very uh, simple way uh, to summarize the problems of finance 1.0 in China. I think they have three structural flaws. 
Number one is that uh, the efficiency level is very low, which means that uh, uh, the current financial uh, system in China cannot allocate uh, the funds uh, to the most efficient sectors uh, in the economy. Uh, for example, here is uh, it's based on one of my research, uh, which shows you um, the distribution of uh, return on invest capital across different ownership. Uh, you can see that uh, SOE is right here. Uh, so return on invest capital on average uh, for SOE is uh, four to six uh, percentage, uh, percentage points lower than non-state sectors. But unfortunately, currently, uh, the banking system in China uh, allocates more than 70% of the bank loans uh, to this sector. So that shows that uh, why we, you know, when, when we talk about uh, uh, the economic transition that is going on in China, we, we are arguing that uh, uh, it's mainly investment that is not efficiency driven uh, because most of the investment actually occurred uh, in this, this sector, which unfortunately is not very efficient. And I think our financial system, uh, in some sense, uh, should be blamed. And also, uh, one of the issues people have been talking about uh, in recent year is about the local government debt. Uh, last year, uh, the National Audit Office uh, released uh, the number. Uh, it shows that uh, the total amount of uh, local debts uh, has amounted to uh, almost 18 uh, trillion RMB, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think it's beyond a lot of people's expectation. And uh, I did some uh, very simple uh, analysis. Uh, I found that uh, basically there's a negative correlation uh, between the uh, local debt and uh, the local economic efficiency. Uh, for example, here on the horizontal axis, I look at the ratio of uh, local debt to local fiscal income. This is on province level, province level. And uh, on the uh, vertical axis, I show you the GDP over total amount of capital stock, uh, which is based on uh, fiscal, uh, as, uh, fiscal asset investments uh, in the previous 20 years. Uh, we, we see a very strong negative correlation. Uh, actually, the R square, if you do a simple regression, the R square is as high as 50%, which says that uh, uh, it is because uh, the local economy, the state sector, uh, is not very efficient. That is uh, the fundamental reason we have, you know, um, a, lo a large number of uh, local debt. So I think uh, this reminds us uh, something must be wrong with uh, the current uh, uh, financial practice uh, in China. Uh, so I think in this context, uh, we try to argue that uh, it is time to uh, reform the, uh, the finance in China. I think the urgency can be shown uh, by two equations. Uh, for example, I, I used to, uh, I love this equation, uh, which is uh, accounting identity. Uh, it shows that the growth rate actually is uh, equal to return on invest capital, uh, ROIC, return on invest capital, multiplied by investment rate. Uh, so if, if you think about the Chinese economy, uh, everybody argues that uh, going forward, uh, the transition itself means that uh, we have to lower investment rate. Uh, if we cannot improve ROIC, uh, uh, lowering investment rate basically means that the growth rate will be lower. And that is a dilemma for the Chinese government because uh, they are concerned about uh, the social stability issue. Like this year, uh, we have 7 million uh, college graduates uh, coming to the job market. You have to provide enough opportunities for those uh, young kids uh, to find jobs. Otherwise, you may have uh, social problems. So uh, the government has uh, some bottom line for this growth rate. And uh, meanwhile, you go is mainly rely on investment rate currently. So this is a dilemma. I think uh, going forward, uh, if China can successfully complete uh, the transition, for example, uh, China uh, can improve uh, return on invest capital, which implies that uh, there are a large number of corpor uh, corporations in China uh, which are able to uh, invest more efficiently. Uh, if the local governments uh, can invest more efficiently, uh, then ROIC can be improved. In that sense, pretty much you find a solution to this dilemma. You can lower investment rate, but meanwhile you increase your return on invest capital, so you can still maintain a reasonable uh, growth rate, maybe 7%, maybe 7.5% uh, based on uh, state council. So I think that is the way we understand uh, what is going on. It's very urgent uh, for corporate China to change from big uh, to, e to efficient, to brilliant, which means that they have to improve return on invest capital. But how to do that? 
Uh, if we look at the fundamental principle uh, in corporate finance, uh, if you want to make you no know, value creating investment projects, uh, this condition has to be satisfied, which means that uh, your return on invested capital has to be bigger than uh, cost of uh, capital. So this actually is a key. Uh, but right now we know that uh, uh, the interest rate in China is still not uh, uh, based on uh, market supply and demand. Uh, it's decided by the, you know, by the government in some sense. So this actually does not mean anything uh, for the decision makers. Uh, I ask a lot of local government officials, I ask them, you know, if you are making an investment project, how do you perceive the cost of capital? Sometimes they think, oh, 5%, maybe zero. I don't care. I don't care at all. I don't care about uh, how much I'm going to pay uh, to borrow a certain amount of money to make an investment. So I think uh, this is a typical issue uh, in China right now, you know, social uh, soft budget constraint problems. So going forward, uh, if we want to uh, solve this problem, I think of financial reform is very, very important, which implies that uh, you have to make sure uh, the weighted average cost of capital is going to be uh, eventually decided by uh, market supply and demand, which means that uh, you have to liberalize uh, your interest rate going forward. So I think that pretty much defines uh, my understanding about the finance 2.0 uh, going forward. I have a couple of um, uh, uh, sentences uh, characterizing uh, the, the features of uh, finance 2.0. I think uh, to be quick, you no know, one is that it has to be efficient, which means that uh, it is able to allocate uh, the, uh, the funds uh, to the most efficient uh, sectors in the economy. For example, you know, private sectors and uh, small and uh, medium-sized uh, enterprises. And also, uh, it has to uh, improve its uh, reach, which means that the current financial services are very limited. Only a small fraction of population and a small fraction of uh, uh, corporations can benefit from that. I think going forward, we want to a larger uh, population and a larger you know, uh, uh, numbers of firms uh, can benefit from that. And also, I think going forward, uh, the uh, finance 2.0 should be uh, in better shape in terms of the structure. Uh, so in, in other words, in some sense, we should reduce uh, its reliance on banking sector. Uh, we should you know, promote uh, corporate bond market, promote uh, local government bond market as well, and uh, to, uh, to, to make this structure much more optimal. And I think uh, the only way to do so, uh, in my understanding, uh, is reform. Uh, especially, you know, I think the government should uh, encourage uh, more innovations uh, in the financial sector. And right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, practice, a lot of innovations at a grassroots level. Uh, for example, like the internet banking uh, sector, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, you know, new things, uh, new financial products have been introduced. Uh, to the uh, Chinese you know, uh, economy. I think that is a good sign. And uh, hopefully, uh, the emergence of the new practice, uh, new financial products will force uh, the formal se sector to change itself. And eventually, we can see a new uh, financial system, which can be called Finance 2.0. And I think the implications, uh, just a, a very quickly, a couple of words. Uh, for firms in China, I think uh, the implication is very straightforward. Uh, going forward, you cannot compete on size anymore. You're going to compete on uh, efficiency. You're going to compete on your business models. So I think that is uh, a very you know, uh, interesting uh, change we're going to see you know, in the next 10 to 20 years. And also, uh, for MNCs, I think um, uh, there are a couple of uh, implications. Uh, number one, uh, probably you're going to compete with uh, domestic firms, uh, which will be much more innovative uh, than before. Uh, so the competition will be uh, much more challenging than before. And uh, I think that is uh, one thing. And also for financial institutions, uh, foreign fi financial institutions, I think um, a good way to think about uh, how to position yourself uh, very well uh, in this context is that uh, if you can come up with some new innovations to serve a broader uh, you know, uh, base of uh, individuals and uh, firms, uh, probably you're going to find your commanding head uh, in the Chinese context. Uh, right now, what I can think about is uh, if you can somehow come up with certain ways uh, to lower the cost of capital uh, for small firms, medium-sized firms in China, if you can come up with some ways to provide financial services uh, to 
uh, the part of population uh, which have been left out uh, from the formal financial system in China probably are going to find a huge room to uh, to make profit. Uh, so I, I think uh, that is a, a very quick in a summary about uh, my thinking uh, about uh, France 2.0. Uh, I'm conscious about the time, so I'm going to stop here, And uh, but I'm open to questions later on. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Professor um, Liu. Um, I, I must say I, I agree with you completely. I, I think financial reform is a, is a key. In fact, I think interest rate liberalization uh, uh, should be the, the top pri uh, priority item uh, on financial sector reform. Um, uh, but I must also say the recent backlash against internet companies clearly caused by this tremendous lobbying of state-owned banks is a, is an unwelcoming development. So I hope this is temporary, right? This is temporary. This is temporary. Any comments, questions uh, from our friends? Um, Professor Liu, I have another uh, question. You see, you see, this session is not about our, our RMB uh, internationalization, but I have to ask you this anyway. So if you have to give a forecast, this year, 2014, RMB is going to appreciate or is going to depreciate or is going to stay constant at this level? Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Um, but it's good I don't have a microphone, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, I think a lot of people actually are interested uh, in knowing what is the equilibrium uh, exchange rate you know, between RMB and uh, US dollars. Some people are talking about a 6.0 or maybe 5.8, etc. Uh, actually, my uh, I have a slightly different view. Um, my, my, my view is that uh, uh, the so-called equilibrium is not that important. Mm. I think the important thing is that uh, uh, whether we're going to see the scope of uh, uh, RMB denominated you know, uh, uh, transactions uh, will increase uh, this year or you know in coming years. I think that probably is a more reliable sign of uh, judging uh, whether uh, the uh, the pace of uh, RMB international internationalization uh, is speeding up. Mm -hmm. So level itself is not sure. important. So that's my answer to your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. As Professor Liu has um, said, uh, Professor Liu has said. Um, when we look at um, RMB's internationalization, the pace of internationalization, we should pay attention to this, the transaction volumes denominated in RMB. And currently, and it's, it's not in top 10 yet, it's not in top 10 yet, um, so, um, um, but it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's growing very, very fast. It's growing very fast. Um, I, I, I don't want to bore you with the details. Uh, for example, uh, China's central bank has signed a bilateral swap agreement with the various central banks, most European central banks in Asia, South Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, in Europe, uh, White Russia, Latin America, so on and so forth. And so, so indeed, I, I think the pace has been um, um, accelerating in, in recent years. And I, I have, um, I, I um, uh, just uh, uh, listed a few bullets to, um, to, to again, to underscore the, the pace of RMB internationalization. First of all, it is a uh, one currency, two market. I mean, Jack's question is, in the United States, um, if we have a fixed exchange rate, how come we have fixed interest rate? How come we have a flexible currency? Well, all you to, to answer your question, you know, a lot of... Uh, Chinese traders, when I'm saying in international trade, they've been engaging in so-called bogus trade. So bogus trade in Shenzhen. What they are trying to do is to arbitrage the interest rate differential between onshore and offshore. So to answer your question, uh, when we look at currency, we cannot overlook exchange uh, interest rate because otherwise it's meaningless, right? Uh, same thing if we look at interest rate, we have to take into can't exchange rate, otherwise it's meaningless. But of course, in today's environment, most countries' interest rate are zero, so you can sort of ignore that. But offshore uh, lending of RMB has been a recent phenomenon, 
and that's actually creating resulting a lot of arbitrage opportunity. Arbitrage opportunity. In 2013, as we know, um, China has set Shanghai Free Trade Zone, Shanghai Free Trade Zone, and so far, uh, not a lot of development. In fact, I believe the reason, and we haven't seen a lot of actions from Shanghai Free Trade Zone because the Shanghai Free Trade Zone is really touching the heart of finance, arbitrage of interest rate, exchange rate. That's why the government is just extremely, extremely cautious. Now, in a few months time, we are going to get the detail in Chinese, Hu Kang Tong. Well, the translation is uh, Shanghai Hong Kong conduit. So for example, I'm sitting in Beijing, and Jack, you are sitting in Hong Kong, and I can buy HSBC shares with a local brokerage firm. And you are in Hong Kong, you can buy A shares, but, but, there's a but. There's but, meaning we can only do that, but we cannot freely convert the proceed into another currency. But you see, that's another step towards uh, uh, internationalization. It's important to look at this chart that has been one way bad. In July 2005, China unpacked RMB exchange rate from the US dollar at a rate 8.28, uh, 8 to be precise. And since then, the old time high against US dollar in January this year was 6.04, and since then, back to 6.3. So the question is, is a weaker RMB a tool of reflation? Now, if you study just basic economics, we know if economy right now is doing poorly. I mean, we all know that economy is doing poorly. So the question is, are you going to spend more money through fiscal spending? The government has ruled that out. It has been bad policy. Are you going to cut interest rate? Difficult, as Professor Liu has said, interest rate are going to be liberalized. That weighted average or cost of capital will move up. So you can't cut interest rate. And can you cut reserve requirement rate? The government has done that in the past few weeks. But the government mainly is targeting rural banks. So because the government understands you need to channel more liquidity and into rural China. So the question is whether a weaker uh, currency is a tool of reflation. I mean, in theory, it is. Because a weaker RMB exchange rate would have the same effect of cutting interest rate. And then, of course, what are the pros and the cons? I have to say, we have a friend from Air China. So a weaker exchange rate wouldn't be good for Air China because um, for certain companies, the debt equity, the, the, the leverage is high, and you borrow a lot of uh, 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 US dollar debt. That, yeah, 70%. So, so for, but in general, as you, 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 you may appreciate the point, China is a huge, huge creditor, not a debtor. And inflation right now is not a risk, given that uh, economy is slowing. So I would argue a weaker exchange rate is actually serving China well. I'm not advocating currency war, and, but I think China is better off by having continued gentle depreciation of the exchange rate. So what are the implications on investment? So, I think the implication on investment are very, very clear, very clear. I, I think in today's environment, assuming, assuming as what Professor Liu has said, the objective is to help improve corporate profit, corporate profit. Therefore, I think a weaker exchange rate will have exporters, that's for sure. And weaker exchange rate, slightly weaker exchange rate, I think would trigger continued outbound investment. And of course, I, I think, um, um, I mean, I should talk to all finance to fix my payroll in US dollars, but they would never do that. So I, 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 think, um, I think I should just uh, stop right here. As Professor Liu said, um, internationalization of RMB is a long-term story. It's, um, it's also a narrowly defined theme, but I think a bigger story is a financial reform. And I, I want to ask you, by the way, do you think interest rate will be liberalized this year? Do you think they are going to move deposit rate this year? Or you think we are going to wait for another year and nothing would happen? Impossible. This year is impossible. 
Why this year is it <laughs> Because some of the say it's a six year. Carmen and Joe said it's going to take two years. But Carmen and Joe is retiring very soon. He still has two years in his term, so. <laughs> very good answer. He still has two years on his term.